Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at game number four of the 2024 World Chess Championship match being played in Singapore. Now yesterday was a rest day after Gukesh won an epic third game to tie the match up at one and a half each. Now as we move into the second portion of three games this is probably a very pivotal moment. In the first three games Gukesh had two whites and one black. Generally when you do play in chess tournaments normally you want to put it pressure on your opponent when you have the white pieces and make draws with the black pieces so in this case ding has white in games four and game six and he is black in game number five with two whites and one black in the section of three games this is a chance for ding to really try and take advantage of the match now it's very hard to judge where exactly we stand because again game number one we thought that ding was in trouble he was able to come back and win game number three it looked like he was completely out prepared um and then he equalized before making a big blunder to lose that game so Ding has the white pieces and let's jump right into the action. So the game starts out with the move knight to f3 and now we get the move d5. Here we have the move e3 being played by Ding and this is a bit of a surprise here frankly because in a world chess championship match the players have many months to prepare for the games and this is an opening that is completely playable. It's very flexible. Strong players like the streamer see Karu Nakamura and the aspiring grandmaster Levy Rosman have played this setup but generally it's not considered to be cutting edge or very critical. So after e3, we get to move knight to f6, and now Ding plays move b3. Now at this point, I was shocked to see this opening in the game because frankly, this is an opening that I myself have played many, many times in online blitz, and it's definitely not something that's very aggressive. And frankly, it's something you play in blitz when you want to get a position and just keep the game going on and on. But objectively, it is nothing special. So after b3, we get the move bishop to f5, and now Ding plays the move bishop e2. Now, fun story. One of the seconds for Ding Loren in this match is Richard Rapport, the famous Grand Master from Hungary. And one really funny fact is that as soon as I saw bishop f5 on the board, I was already wondering if we were going to get a move like bishop a3 here. And the reason is that all the way back in 2022, in the FIDE Grand Prix held in Berlin, I played against none other than Richard Rapport. And in that match, it was a two-game mini match. I won the first game with the white pieces before the second game now over the course of that evening before we played the next game I was talking to my second Chris Littlejohn and we we're talking about some ideas and I actually shared this with my stream earlier um but Chris basically wrote me a message and he said I looked at this Bishop a3 crap now all the way back in 2022, one of Ding's seconds, Ridge Report, had played this, as I just mentioned. So this is not some new idea playing for Bishop A3. And frankly, I would argue that after B3, Bishop F5, no matter what you do, Bishop A3, Bishop B2, etc., Black has a very comfortable position. So you get Bishop E2, H6, and now Ding plays the move Bishop to A3 here. Once again, this should come as no surprise to anybody because Richard has played this before. But even I myself have played this in 10 Blitz games on chess.com against strong grandmasters. So this idea should be nothing super new. It doesn't really have that feel of a great surprise. And frankly, I was very disappointed to see this being played because in a match where you have six months to prepare for a specific opponent being D. Gukesh, I expected something a little bit better. So after bishop to a3, we get to move knight b to d7 here, and now, now Ding plays the move castles. Here, Gukesh plays e6, and I must point out that even back in 2022, I already knew about the setup with e6 here to try and trade the bishops on f8. So now we get the move bishop takes bishop, and here Gukesh correctly takes with the knight. Now, if your opponent isn't familiar with this variation, it is possible that maybe they'll think, well, wait, what do I do? If I go e6 here, white can trade the bishops, and now if you take with a rook, king cannot castle, and if you take with a king, you definitely can't castle either. But after, after we get this position here with e6 takes, now black can correctly play the move knight takes f8 in this position, and here black is still able to move the knight away and castle the king out of the center of the board. So now we get the move c4 being played by Ding, and here Gukesh plays knight back to d7. We now get the move knight to c3, and here Gukesh decides the castle. Now at this point in the game, it's worth mentioning that I felt Gukesh should have played the move c6, whether right away 
or even after knight c3 here rather than castling because I thought that in this position if white gets a structure with the trade on d5 it's the slight imbalance here and maybe white can create some counterplay whereas if you ever go c6 and we get the trade now black structure is very solid it's also symmetrical here all the pawns are on the same files additionally it's worth pointing out here that if we were to get d4 and c6 being played this is very similar to one of the main lines which can occur out of the normal order with bishop b2 being played where the bishops are on d6 and b2 but here the bishops have been traded so now we get takes e takes d5 and now ding plays the move b4 here Gukesh plays c6 and now we get the move knight to d4 attacking the bishop bishop to h7 and now we have the move queen b3 now at this point we've reached a pretty balanced middle game the argument here for white is that white wants to push some p on the queen side try to attack maybe b5 down the road to target the pawn on c6 or a4 a5 a6 one sample line just to show you guys is that white can't really go b5 because there's c5 to attack the knight but after a5 king h8 for example white can go a6 to undermine the pawn chain you move you you move the pawn you lose the pawn on c6 and if you play a move like a6 to stop it now white can try to go knight a4 knight c5 and get this nice bastion on d4 as well as a connect five and pressure on the open b file as well so that's the white dream that's what ding is hoping to get but realistically very unlikely to get all those moves for free so now Gukesh plays this move 95 and this move is completely fine according to computer but I actually was not a big fan of this move because initially I thought that maybe white could play f4 gaining time this is what we call tempo you attack the horse you kick the horse away and maybe you improve your position however this shows great understanding from Gukesh here because f4 is actually a fairly serious mistake because now if you play a4 and we get something like 97 here and white goes a5 a6 as a sample line whenever white goes knight to a4 there's always knight to e4 here attacking the pawn on d2 and now because you've pushed the pawn to f4 you no longer can move this pawn to f3 to kick the knight away from e4 this also reminds me of a famous quote from the from the Armenian American philosopher Levon Aronian who made the statement some years back that once you move a pawn forward you can never move it backwards very deep very philosophical that's why we consider love to be one of the great philosophers in the game of chess today um but it's also worth pointing out this shows understanding because I thought this was bad on first glance but Gukesh correctly understands that f4 is not actually a great move so here we got the move a4 from Ding and now Gukesh plays rook c8 and we get the move a5 now for Ding he's trying to push his pee on the queen side with the rook on c8 and the knight on e5 however any idea of playing for a6 here let's just say king h8 a6 really is very ineffective because black can play b6 here now the pawn is guarded by the knight and the rook and down the road black is even maybe considering to play c5 here to build this bit of a big black center and kick this horse away from d4 so it is an idea but here Gukesh plays move b6 instead and this is actually a very slight inaccuracy from Gukesh here, and this does open the door for Ding if he is calculating very well to maybe get a slight advantage now the computer wants black to play b5 here and after takes takes it's going to be very similar a very similar situation but the reason for b5 is that after you go b6 here white has the opportunity to play bishop to a6 attacking the rook on c8 if you move the rook away now again there's f4 and the pawn on c6 is a huge weakness here and after you play rook to c7 in this position white can now play the move f4 attacking the knight and if black plays the move knight c4 this is just a sample line after takes 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 you might be thinking well wait black goes c5 takes takes knight f3 and it's uh-oh spaghetti time there's bishop d3 attacking the queen and the rook at the same time and winning some material however after c5 white can play the in-between move knight c to b5 attacking the rook black can move the rook to let's just say c8 trying to guard the pawn on c5 if you move rook d7 just to show a sample line takes 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 white is up a couple of pawns here and doing very well so let's just say black goes rook c8 now you can play knight takes pawn attacking the rook pawn takes knight knight takes rook takes 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 now you get a takes b6 and here we have a big imbalance where white has a rook and a couple of juicers in return for a bishop and a knight and if black goes bishop e4 to stop the pawn thrust here now white can play d3 bishop b7 and rook c1 and at this point white is completely winning because one of these rooks is going to the seventh rank whether it be a7 or c7 and white is completely winning unfortunately here after b6 ding does not find this and one of my great concerns during the game which I said 
um, on my kick stream is that I was worried that if Ding did not see this Bishop a6 move, there's a very good chance he would trade and play Knight f3 and simply simplify the game and make a draw. And unfortunately, my intuition was proven correct. As here, Ding plays the move Knight f3. He does not trade on b6 right away, but now pieces are coming off the board. And as soon as I saw this move, I started slamming my hand on my table because I was very upset because I knew the game would be ending in a draw. So now we get takes, takes, and now we have d4 from Gukesh. Ding plays knight e2. We get takes, takes, and now we get bishop e4. Now, material remains the same in this position, but with such limited material, really no major weaknesses here. Black might have a weak pawn on, on the c file down the road. This game is going to be a draw with near certainty. So we get rook d1, queen e7, takes, 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 and now we get the move knight c3. Now, this move is basically saying, you know what? I'm happy to draw the game. And for me, this signifies something very, very bad from a psychological standpoint from Ding Loren, which is that he is not even trying in this game. He had one very, very slight opportunity with bishop a6 if he were 3,500 stockfish. But other than that, he basically has got nothing in his second game in a row with the white pieces against Digu Kesh. And this cannot bode well for the match. So we get rook fd8, takes, takes. And now we get h3 here from Ding, creating the classic look for the king on h2. We get c5, takes, 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 rook c1. And now we have queen e5 being played. Now, at this point, the game is headed towards a draw no matter what happens. And to illustrate just how drawn this is, let's just say white were able to win this pawn on c5, for example, and you get this, this position. This has been played in two very topical games. First one that I want to point out is there was a game between Magnus Carlsen, that famous streamer, Hikaru Nakamura from Norway Chess, I believe in 2016 or 2017, where Magnus, the greatest endgame player of all time, had the extra pawn but was unable to win. But much more recently, there was a game played in Norway Chess this year, 2024, between Hikaru Nakamura and Ding Loren, the current world champion himself, where Hikaru had the extra E pawn and still it was a draw. So even if Ding is somehow able to win the C pawn, and he gets an extra pawn. This will still be a draw no matter what. We get queen to c2 being played. Gukesh plays rook to d5 to guard the pawn. And now we get g3. We got f5 being played here. And now we have the move king g2. Now at this point, there's no doubt the game is going to be a draw. But one interesting thing happened here, which is that when you look at this position after queen to c2, Gukesh has 39 minutes on the clock and he spends 14 and a half minutes before playing rook to d5. Now my assumption behind this move is that Gukesh was probably trying to use a little bit of time, relaxing and savoring the moment because he knows that he cannot lose the game here he survived another game with the black pieces without too much difficulty but additionally i also think that since this is a match he wants to start playing some mind games with ding here where he wants ding to start thinking he doesn't want ding to realize he can't just get a draw instantly this is very much in the spirit of magnus carlson the five-time world champion where even if the game was drawn in many of these matches he still keeps the game going until the very end because on a psychological or a mental level you want your opponent to be afraid and know that you're never happy with a draw you will never compromise and you always want to go for the kill so that's why we got this g3 move and now we have f5 now this is a move that i didn't actually love here and ding does stop to think after it because everybody and their brother knows the game will be a draw here but when you go f5 you are potentially creating a new weakness here now your king can become a little bit weak on the diagonals if white gets rook b1 rook b8 and even though it's fine it is a little bit of an interesting choice pun unintended so here we get king g2 being played, and now Gukesh goes king to h7. Gukesh could have played queen to e4, trading off the queens. And after rook c4, rook e5, the rook does double duty here. It guards both the pawns from being captured, and black will try to bring the king to the center. Gukesh instead plays king to h7, and now we get to move queen c4, and here we have queen d6 being played. Now again, you'll notice here that for Gukesh, he's taking a little bit of time to play his moves, whereas Ding is moving instantly, and it's abundantly clear, once again to everybody, that Ding wants to make the draw and get out of town as quickly as possible. Gukesh, however, wants again to keep the game going. He wants to make Ding have to play a couple more moves, make Ding think about the situation so that in future games, if they reach an end game where where Ding thinks it's going to be an instant draw, Gukesh can play on, and he has to worry about that possibility. So now we get e4 being played. Gukesh goes rook to e5 in this position, and now we get pawn takes pawn. Here, Ding, here Gukesh plays rook takes pawn, and now we get queen to e4 here, and Gukesh goes queen to d5, pinning the queen on the diagonal. If black were to play king g6, for example, now white has g4, and it's a big uh-oh spaghetti -o moment as your rook is pinned, and you will lose the game in a very, very embarrassing fashion. So you get the move queen to d5, and now Ding trades the queens on d5, and here he goes king to f3. 
Now we get to move king to g6 being played, and here we get king to e4. Gukesh plays rook to d4, and now we get a repetition with king to e3, rook to d5, king e4, rook d4, king e3, and now after rook to d5, the game simply ends in a draw. Now, this is an extremely disappointing result, I'm going to be honest. Um, at this point, very, very disappointing um, to see this happen where Ding Loren is unable to put any pressure whatsoever on Gukesh. But I'm also going to be honest about this. In my opinion, when you have six months to prepare for, for a world championship match and more importantly, a specific opponent, Ding's openings, specifically with White in these first two games, games two and game four, have been very far from uh, acceptable in my opinion. In game two, he plays him. It was very, very dry. Now, considering the match situation, he was up 1-0. Don't have a huge issue with it. He even got a chance to maybe squeeze an end game, and he didn't try very hard. But after winning the first game, I don't really have any issue with that. It's understandable to try and consolidate the advantage, not take too much risk since you're leading. But after losing game number three with the black pieces, I'm going to be honest. Seeing this opening that was played today in game four by Ding, in my opinion, this was not an opening that was really that is really acceptable in a world championship match when you have all this time to study. I said this during my stream, and I know some people are going to be mad at me for saying this, but I do consider this to be the truth, or at least how I view it, which is that, frankly, I could have shown up today to the board in Gukesh's situation with the black pieces, and if Ding played this opening with no prep whatsoever, I could have played this exact same opening that Gukesh did, and I would not have lost the game. And I think to me, that speaks volumes about where Ding is at. Considering he lost this, he lost the third game with the black pieces. In this fourth game with White, you have to go for it. He's been under massive pressure in both of his black games. I know he won the first game, but he was under pressure. He's completely out prepared in that game as well as the third game. And I think the strategy of drawing with White and trying to save the games with black is a big, big mistake from Ding Loren. And I would also say that when you look at the match strategy, you expect Ding to be in a situation where he knows that he's under pressure with Black and he's going to bring his absolute best openings to the table. And this is not it. This game, frankly, to me, felt like the opening that you play in a blitz or a rapid game. is something that you prepare for like 30 minutes before, before a quick game that with very little on the line. And you just play chess, you try to have fun and win in a long game. This does not seem like something that you can play in a world championship match and win with. Um, so I'm very, very disappointed. I think this bodes very poorly for, for the match that goes forward. I think also because from the standpoint of Gukesh, he must be riding really high now, feeling extremely confident because much like the way that I feel, I'm sure that no doubt he is thinking about this game. He's saying, what is this nonsense? This is not a serious opening try. And if this is the best that Ding has, has in game four where he needs to really put pressure on Gukesh, then what else can he really have left in the tank? And so I think this bodes very, very poorly for Ding. I think think for the Indian fans out there, the Gukesh fans, as long as Gukesh keeps it together, I really am, am struggling to see a world where this match isn't going to, where the tide isn't going to start turning um, in Gukesh's favor. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. I would say, you know, I would reiterate that every game has its ebbs and flows, but if, but if Ding is able to get an easy draw at the black pieces, that's a good sign. If he's under pressure, even if he draws a game, if he's under pressure out of the opening tomorrow, every white game that he has is going to be magnified. That the pressure on him to try and put pre to try and get an advantage will be higher and higher. And I'm not feeling very good about things right now. I think for the Indian fans, they should be feeling really good about Gukesh's chances. And um, we'll see what happens. Obviously, it's a long match. But based on what I've seen from White with uh, Ding so far in this match, I'm not feeling good at all for, for Ding or his Chinese fans. I think it's looking like it's going to be a very long match uh, in spite of the score being tied after four games. So I could be wrong, but we will find out. At any rate, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap from the fourth game of the 2024 World Chess Championship being played in Singapore. If you are not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below. And we'll be back with a recap after game number five tomorrow. So I'll see you soon. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.